Good morning. Um, like to uh, call the Thursday, November 7th meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transpor Transportation Commission to order. Uh, the will the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Bertrand? Here. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? Present. Commissioner Caput? Here. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Here. Commission Alternate Merlhern? Commissioner Leopold? Here. Commissioner McPherson? Here. Commission Alternate Lynn? And Commissioner Lowe? Here. How about Commissioner Gonzalez? Oh. And Commissioner Gonzalez? <laughs> Here. <laughs> okay. OK, we'll go to item number two, oral communications. Is there anyone in the audience would like to address us uh, on an issue that is not on the agenda? Or if there is one on the agenda and you're not able to stay to listen to it, I think we're going to have a pretty quick meeting today. But come on up, please, and state your name and uh, your concerns. Thank you, sir. Let's see. Wait a minute. Is that, is that on? Um, his mic will be on. I'll use my outdoor there you go. voice. You're there in. It is. Okay. You're, we can hear you now. Thank you. All right. My name is Barry Scott. I live in Aptos. And uh, I really just wanted to come in today to thank uh, the staff and the commissioners for receiving uh, the presentation from TIGM, the Battery Electric Streetcar Company, on September 5th. Right. Um, and the, you know, it, 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 we live in a, in a, in part of the tech region of the nation, of the world. And this vehicle, I did some studying on it, and it's a remarkable cutting edge technology, uh, renewable energy powered, very light, uh, streetcar system and for it to come to this community for a demonstration of two weeks I think is just a, a, a remarkable opportunity and I want to thank all the commissioners for receiving uh, so well that presentation and for RTC staff for working on the details of making this demonstration project uh, happen. Um, related to that and in support of that I'm also grateful to see budget items that uh, include working on drainage and vegetation management and track upkeep, uh, consistent with Measure D and the 8% that uh, ostensibly is for rail corridor work, along with some of the uh, trail corridor, you know, trail uh, percentage of, of Measure D, which goes, I understand, to, to some, of the, some of the maintenance of that corridor. So I just really wanted to thank the staff and thank the commission, and I look forward to uh, seeing, seeing that demonstration occur and maybe other demonstrations. So thanks very much. You're welcome. Uh, Michael Saint with Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, you have a handout there in front of you, and it is basically the uh, project called the High Desert Project that goes between uh, highways 14 and 15 in the High Desert there by Palmdale and um, Victorville. Um, presently, that's the first new freeway that's being built in Los Angeles, Southern California area in 25 years. And basically the reason that they wanted to build a new freeway, this was going to be 8 to 10 lanes, um, is that they have squandered uh, tens of billions of dollars widening existing highways that were predicted to solve congestion, but have just made the congestion worse. I'm not going to read the specifics since you have that in front of you. But basically, from coast to San Gabriel Valley, they have been uh, canceling uh, expansion projects consistently, even though there are some continuing that had been on the books. The goal is to not widen highways anymore. Um, I mention all this because we have an opportunity here in Santa Cruz County because of our small population. Um, I think the situation uh, going to transition from single occupancy vehicles to mass transit would be a lot easier in a population of 270,000 people versus Southern California's population of 24 million people. Basically, I feel uh, Southern California's kind of passed no return. I think they're scrambling to try to do whatever they can to get people to move. It's just too many around there. Um, a smaller population as ours would be easier to transition to mass transit than waiting for a million or two people to show up here in the future. Um, I think it would be prudent and fiscally responsible to make choices that uh, you move people and not cars. 
Um, if we jump on the correct modes of transportation, mass transit, walking, biking, carpooling, telecommuting, uh, we can cut emissions immedi immediately and play a role in California's long-term emissions reductions strategy and also help in our congestion problem. If widening highways worked, Los Angeles would have no traffic. And just a spoiler alert there, on October 2nd, 2019, Caltrans settled an environmental lawsuit by canceling the High Desert Project. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Brian Peoples with executive, or no, executive leader, director of Trail Now. Um, my day job, I'm an engineer. I work for a very high-tech company. Actually, the company I work for is very large, but they're actually in Santa Cruz County as well. And I'm, you know, the thing when we look at it as an engineer, we do a lot of model engineering. You know, when we analyze a system, we do modeling. And, and I want to kind of give you an analogy here of a modeling example you would do on your transportation system in Santa Cruz County. You have three corridors that go down. You have Highway 1, SoCal, and the rail corridor. Those are all, if you look at them like water pipes, if you do a fluid dynamics analysis, water pipes, and the people within those are water. <clears throat> so how do you increase the capacity of Highway 1? Well, you deal with the surges. In transportation, congestion typically is during commute hours, so you get a surge. So you need to open up the pipe as much as possible to absorb those. You also, if you look at transportation when traffic, Cars actually have space between them. It's air pockets. So you want to reduce those air pockets. Technology is doing that today with autonomous cars. Even the cars you buy today have that adjustable cruise control. Autonomous cars actually shows that the highway capacity can increase by 250% by taking the individuals and reducing those bubbles. The density within the cars you increase the density of, of the cars with policies, HOV lanes, encourage people to carpool. Now let's look at SoCal Drive. How do you do that? SoCal Drive, you control the lights, right? You control the intersections. Make sure that you control that. Now let's look at a rail line. Let's look at, okay, how does a water pipe work for a rail line? Well, you take a container, you fill it up with water, you put it in the pipe, and you shoot it. You wait 15 minutes, you fill up another container, and you shoot it. And actually for Santa Cruz, you shoot it the other way because it's a single rail line. And you continue to do that. Basically, 99% of the time, that pipe is empty. So that's how you do an engineering model. You want to maximize the use of those corridors. Does that make sense? You want to maximize those corridors rather than thinking how can we get people in mass transit. Look at it from a systems engineering approach. How do I improve my flow? And right now, two-thirds of our system is shut down. Or excuse me, one-third of our system is shut down. The Santa Cruz Coastal Trail is shut down. We're not using it. We need to use it. We need to open that third pipeline. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us in oral communications? Well, hello, Mr. Hurst. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for being here. My name is Lowell Hurst, and I'm a, a councilman with the city of Watsonville. You know, when I woke up this morning, I had several choices. I could have gone back to bed. I could have shaved. <laughs> I could have spent a couple hours in a coffee shop with friends. But I wanted to be here today because I think that you always need encouragement and you always need thanks. And I want to thank the staff for their hard work. You brought many, many resources to Watsonville, and we want to say our appreciation for that. Oh, there's lots more to do, of course. Lots more to do. You know, there's uh, connector lanes and uh, in, uh, traffic improvements of all kinds, uh, blinking lights on the freeway, uh, more trails and rails, more mass transit, bus on shoulder, all kinds of great things that, that can be done. And I want to say thank you for the things that you have done. Our sidewalk improvements uh, and bike lanes are, are enhancing our, our pedestrian traffic uh, a great deal, and we want to continue along those lines. 
but there is more to be done and let's get moving and let's get stuff done so today's a wonderful day to get stuff done right right thank you very much yes sir anyone else want to cheerlead us um, <laughs> All right, we'll close the uh, oral communications. Um, going to item number three, are there any additions uh, or uh, to the consent or regular agenda? Anybody have any additions or, or pull anything from it? Okay, we'll go to the consent agenda. Uh, we have several items on that. Um, anybody have an, want to make a comment on it or move to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda. agenda. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Okay, now we will move to item number 29. Uh, oh, excuse me, commissioner reports. Is there any commissioner, item number 28, any commissioner have an oral report that they would like to comment on? Seeing none, we'll go to the um, director, executive director's report. Thank Mr. you, Preston. Chair. Um, I'll start today's report with um, RTC recruitments and capital project management delivery services. As mentioned at the last RTC meeting, RTC is moving forward with permanently filling transportation planner and transportation planning technician positions. These recruitments are to fill recent vacancies created by retirements and resignations. Advertisements are located on the RTC website and recruitment is open to both internal and external applicants. The closing date for the planning applicants is November 8th, and for planning technician applicants, it is November 22nd. RTC has also issued a request for proposals for capital project delivery management consulting services. These services would be to assist staff in the project delivery management of projects on the rail line and the state highway system, including auxiliary lane projects, storm damage, capital maintenance projects, MBSST projects, and other regional capital project delivery needs. The closing date on that advertisement was um, Monday, November 4th. Staff plans to interview, select, and recommend that the RTC enter into one or more contracts at our next meeting on December 4th. Um, my next item is related to the strategic implementation plan for Measure D. In November 2016, voters of Santa Cruz County approved Measure D a half cent transaction and use tax with a term of 30 years. The Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission is designated administrator of Measure D. The ordinance requires that RTC allocate, administer, and oversee the expenditure of all measure revenues which are not directly allocated by formula annually to other agencies, consistent with an implementation plan, which will be updated at least every five years following a public hearing. The purposes of an implementation plan are to define the scope, cost, and delivery schedule of expenditure plan projects or programs detailing the revenue projections and possible financing tools needed to deliver the expenditure plan within the 30 years promised to the voters, and describe the risks, critical issues, and opportunities that RTC, as the local transportation authority, should address to expeditiously deliver the expenditure plan. Over the last few months, staff has been working on the development of an inaugural strategic implementation plan. I expect to release a draft plan by the end of this year, with a public hearing expected for either the January or February RTC meetings. The focus of the plan will be on maximizing the delivery of all regional projects and programs identified in the expenditure plan, with an emphasis on how best to leverage Measure D to funds to secure grants in order to fully fund and to deliver the plan. My next item is related to the 2019 Focus on the Future Conference. This is a self-help county with a trans for uh, counties with transportation sales tax measures. The RC is now a member of the California Self-Help Counties Coalition, and the Self-Help Co uh, Counties Coalition uh, will be holding um, its annual conference focus on the future uh, later this month in San Diego. I will be attending the conference with uh, our uh, engineer, transportation engineer, Sarah Christensen, and uh, we will be uh, networking with other uh, sales tax measure counties on um, how best to um, deliver the expenditure plan here in, in this county um, based on the experiences that they've had in delivering theirs. 
Um, I have an announcement regarding segment 18 of the MBSST project. This is the section in Watsonville. The city of Watsonville began advertisement for bids on October 23rd to construct the first section of the Watsonville Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail. This section of trail will extend 1,600 feet between Olani Parkway and the Watsonville Slough Trailhead. The bids will open on December 17th. Construction is planned to begin in the spring of 2020. This project has received funds from the Active Transportation Program, the Gas Tax, the City of Watsonville, the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, and Friends of the Rail and Trail. Um, I've previously um, uh, spoken to you regarding the ENT TAC membership recruitment, and that recruitment continues. Um, we have taken extensive effort to recruit and fill these vacant positions on the RTC's Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee. This has included ads through print media and electronic media. It has also included direct outreach to specific individuals as they have been suggested as potential candidates with invitations to attend meetings of the END TAC. Some of those potential members have attended and one of the next steps is to submit and receive individual commissioners' names of potential candidates to positions representing specific supervisorial districts for nomination by the commission. And finally, in uh, uh, the 2019 San Lorenzo Valley Environmental Town Hall um, is an event that's scheduled every year. As in the past, RTC staff will be participating in this event scheduled for November 23rd. The event will include Assembly Member Mark Stone and will bring together a variety of nonprofit and public agencies to provide information to the San Lorenzo Valley community and hear from the community about their concerns. And that concludes my report. Very well. <clears throat> Is there any um, commissioners? Have, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair. So uh, you brought up the term bids, uh, and, you, and you mentioned that um, Watsonville is doing that. And I didn't bring it up, but during the um, consent agenda, there were massive numbers of engineering firms and so forth that uh, we are now in contract with. So speaking of bids, when you sign those agreements with consultants, do you go through a bidding process? And if you don't, why not? We go through a proposal process. And for engineering services, most of those contracts are for architectural and engineering services. And um, there is a, um, a provision in uh, the law that does not allow you to select architectural and engineering services based on cost. And that's done intentionally because you don't necessarily want the cheapest engineer. You really want the most qualified engineer. So um, we do try to control uh, a scope, schedule, and budget on all of our contracts. Um, a lot of the, the items on the consent calendar today were um, extensions of contracts due to um, things that were outside the control of the consultants, such as uh, um, the response time of the jurisdictional agencies issuing permits. So, so I understand the flexibility there, but just given the fact that you do have flexibility, and even though cost is not really a, a, a primary consideration, how do you how do you determine? So, if in, in other words, if if a qualified architect comes in, but you know through your experience is you know five times more expensive than you think it should be. Uh, do you have the flexibility of going somewhere else and, and trying to find an alternative? If you, we cannot uh, negotiate cost with the uh, most qualified firm, we do have an allowance to move on to the next um, uh, uh, firm and negotiate with them. Um, one of the things we do do, even though we can't look at um, necessarily their cost proposal, we do ask for um, proposers to provide a detailed estimate of the number of hours that they think it would be necessary to complete the work. And we ac actually ask for their approach regarding the scope so we can clearly understand the level of effort that they think is needed to deliver the project and we control it in that way. So it goes to their uh, efficacy and efficiency? Absolutely. And, and we are able to, to, to um, select consultants based on, on that. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from commissioners? With uh, following up on his question, if if we had a, a bad history with somebody we hired before, 
can you just say we don't want to deal with them again, or do you have to actually go through a process? Part like, of uh, what I'm getting at is uh, a lawsuit that re you know that happened years ago or whatever. We can ask questions regarding um, whether or not they um, had uh, legal challenges on their work in the past. We can um, certainly um, check references and um, base part of our criteria in selecting firms um, as um, their past performance. And so okay. we do do that, and we do consider those when we select firms. Yes, sir. I, I have one question, and it, it got by me, what, um, but it is in regards to the bids. But this bid for service is the janitorial service and the community tree services. And reading through the language, uh, there's part of that contract that says that the, for it to be prevailing wage, the commission has to initial it. Is that, is that going to be a process that's still followed, or is that should have been addressed on consent agenda? So um, if prevailing wages is a requirement under the contract, then when we execute that contract, we make sure that the contractor in question is aware that they would need to pay prevailing wages on the contract. And we make sure we do that at the administrative level when we execute the contract itself. Okay, yeah, because reading through the contract on the terms, it, it, they had it stated there is it's only prevailing wage only if it's initialed by the commission. And so I, that's just to clarify that. That's correct. And so for the um, uh, prevailing wages is required for the tree service work and for the janitorial work, it's actually not required to be for prevailing wages. So we'll be initialing the one um, for, for tree services, but not for the one for the janitorial services. Any other questions? <coughs> okay. We'll move on to the Caltrans report. Oh, oh excuse me, I, Mr. Peoples, I didn't say. Appreciate that. I'm Brian Peoples, uh, Executive Director of Trail Now. I want to um, take a moment and um, support RTC staff on their effort to bring in the expertise. Um, having pro professional experience myself in dealing with contractors and engineering contractor firms through a corporation, um, I think what I've seen, it's very good, um, the approach that they're taking. Um, so I want to take a moment, though, just to recognize that they're, you know, they're in a situation now. They're dealing with not being a transportation agency as much as a property management firm. You know, they now have this corridor that goes across. And they're basically coming outside of their normal realm of engineering, transportation planning. They've moved to being a property management organization as well. So you have to step back and understand that that their requirements on the skills and the build of the people within their staff have to be able to deal with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments from the public from the director's report? Okay, we'll um, move on to now the Caltrans report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, commissioners. I mentioned last month that we had a new director at Caltrans, and he was sworn in on October 23rd. It was a proud moment, and many of the staff watched the ceremony um, over the internet. So that was a very uh, that was an exciting day uh, to to uh, to feel settled now with new leadership and going forward with uh, um, what we have, what the governor has set forward as um, the administration's priorities. Uh, I want to follow up on a question from last month had to do with the applications for the 5310 program. For your background, the federal program for 5310 is a transit program to improve mobility for seniors and individuals with disabilities by removing barriers to transportation services and expanding the transportation mobility options that are available to them. Uh, the specific question had to do with the uh, equipment type that was being purchased and the uh, uh, the request was for gas, uh, gas-powered buses, and the question was, c can electric vehicles be um, purchased? And sad but true, uh, it, uh, vi electric vehicle buses cannot be acquired with the 5310 program currently, uh, and that is simply a matter of uh, dollars. The uh, statewide budget for rural areas is 14 million, and the current cost for electric vehicle buses is so much higher than gas-fueled vehicles that would vastly limit uh, the number of rural areas that could be served. So for the time being, 
uh, uh, EVs are not an eligible purchase under that program. However, there is an effort underway to change that. And in time, I think we would expect that because there's such a commitment to change over the fleet that we will eventually get there. But for this round, it's, it's not currently an option. So I did want to reply to you on that point. Um, you have our updated uh, project information in your binder. Uh, there's a couple highlights that I, I want to touch on. Uh, one project um, was removed because the construction is complete, but I wanted to make sure you knew, knew that the um, ADA project to upgrade the, um, to install sidewalks uh, for ADA compliance um, uh, near Watsonville was completed in September. Uh, you also asked me about, I guess I was going to do general things before specific things. So um, going back to general things, there was also a question asked about how long does it take to get a project from basically initiation to construction, such as what is um, happening on Highway 1 right now. So on Highway 1, there's a, a, very, there's a project that's about 7.3 miles long. It includes uh, pavement preservation, bridge rails, ADA ramp upgrades, uh, and a variety of things. Uh, that project basically got its initiation about six years ago. We start the initiation project, and then once we program a project, it's generally a four-year time frame to get it into construction. That's the general time frame for a shop project. The exception, uh, there are exceptions. One exception is for safety. Uh, projects where we have a uh, collision concentration and a, a compelling need to address things on a very, um, uh, you know, rapid time frame. We were able to accelerate those, and there, there were features. There is a feature of safety that was rolled into that project for construction, so we're still able to achieve the efficiencies, but a, a component of that was delivered in a probably a two- or three-year time frame. And then, um, and then on the other side of things, we have what we call long lead projects that take more than four years, and examples of that would be uh, r bridge replacements over uh, live streams, sensitive habitat areas, and things like that. So we generally refer to the SHOP program as a, a four-year cycle, four-year programming cycle from programming to construction. Uh, and then um, the reference to Highway 17, I think, still is, is uh, something that uh, this commission and Caltrans need to work together on to find funding sources before we could initiate that project, the initiation process. That was that was a long answer to those two questions. Um, and then um, one more question back on specifics with your list is uh, the, uh, the long-awaited uh, pedestrian enhancements uh, that include the Marchant area near the high school will uh, go to construction anticipated in February of this year. It, it will be ready to list this month. Uh, and then there's a, a contract advertisement award process. We're expecting contract approval in February. And I want to point out that um, on that particular project that we were able to work with uh, your staff to roll in uh, several locations of co crosswalk enhancements from on Highway 9, that the RTC received funding um, through uh, another hi highway safety improvement program. So we're also combining forces and doing more. Um, and we are also asking the contractor in the case of that project to prioritize the high school location and two others to you know, ask them to do that first. Because generally when we issue a contract, it's up to the contractor to determine the order of work. And so we've made that special request. Any Thank other, you. Any Thank questions? Thank you for answering those questions. Yeah. Yes. Um, the question I have in it, and it doesn't show up on this list here because it has to do with our downtown plan. And since the downtown plan has been adopted and it goes to Caltrans to work with Caltrans, um, we, we, there's going to be an EIR process and there's going to be um, a traffic study process that takes place. Who would be responsible since this is um, a Caltrans corridor for those studies? The, um, the project sponsor usually would initiate those. Cal because Caltrans has the lead agency responsibility, it would, it would still come under our purview, it would potentially be an oversight project. Uh, in some cases, depending on the extent of the change, whether an EIR was needed for the improvements on the state highway system could st still be evaluated. 
and um, um, otherwise, if it's um, if you're implementing the whole plan and doing an EIR that's citywide, uh, there would be a piece of that. But uh, Caltrans does retain lead agency authority uh, for the most part on the state highway system. But we can we're certainly interested in working with you to streamline things uh, to the extent that we have improvements that we can support and uh, work with you to implement. Thank you. Any other question, Mr. Mr. Bertrand? Um, thank you very much for the grant and the go ahead to work on uh, aligning all the lights on 41st. Uh, so finally we could actually deal with the, uh, the bridge going over Highway 1. Uh, thank you, Caltrans, for that. Great. That should help um, tremendously. Mr. Caput? Uh, I want to thank you for, uh, on 30-2, uh, the uh, completion of the sidewalks uh, from Wagner to pretty much all the, almost all the way to Houlihan. We, we call that East, East Lake uh, Avenue, but it's Highway 152. So uh, good job. Thank you. And then uh, <coughs> the uh, item number eight on the same page is the... Uh, uh, pedestrian signal upgrades and I'm assuming that one of those would be the Marchant Street and East Beach which is uh, uh, to put in a pedestrian crossing right there by Watsonville High School is, is that uh, is that correct I they're they're all kind of thrown together yes that will go to construction in February and we're we're just wrapping up the design plans this month to get it ready to list for advertising <coughs> contract yeah I have the the report uh, uh, part of the report says it's going to go out to bid and then on uh, item number eight it says the project was awarded to um, crosstown electrical and data does that mean they're going to do all of those projects, or does that mean? Uh, pr project number eight, if it's the same version I'm looking at, um, the pedestrian signal upgrades, um, that project is already in construction. It'll be completed in January. Okay. That's different than the Marchant Street project. Okay. Yeah. And I, I don't know if this is under your purview, but uh, the... Uh, the upgrade of the intersection right there at Houlihan and 152, uh, that's with uh, Public Works right now. Is that, you're working with uh, Public Works on that one? Yes, that's a, the, the county is delivering that project. So maybe you want to get an update from them. Would it be appropriate to ask, uh, Steve, can you give a little update on that? It, it's a big project and it's very complicated, but uh, uh, you're on top of it. I know that. It is. Good morning. Um, uh, the project actually is about 95% designed and we're in the right of way purchasing phase right now. Um, we still have a little bit more money to round out to the full construction financing. Um, Caltrans is contributing uh, 500000 in minor A funding to, towards that project. And we've been working pretty actively with them. And um, we've got to be in construction by June 2021. So we're pretty confident that by that day we'll have all the construction funding we need and we'll be in construction that summer. And what's the total cost approximately? In around three to four million. Okay, and how much do we have now? Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 2.5. Okay, yeah. thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just would uh, appreciate if we got regular updates on the questions of uh, availability of bus funding. Uh, you know, there's a state mandate that we that uh, that we have to go to zero emission uh, vehicles. Uh, our uh, transit district has committed to, to doing that, um, and so the clock is ticking. And uh, so it would be nice if if the if all the arms of the state um, uh, lined up uh, correctly, so we could access those funding, because we're in a, a multi-year effort to replace our bus system, and we want to be able to replace them with the buses that will be with us for a while not with buses that will not be eligible uh, at some point. Any other comments from commissioners? Uh, anybody from the public would like to address us on this issue? Uh, yes, Michael Sink, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. I want to thank Eileen and Caltrans. I was the one that asked the question about the electric vehicles. 
And I appreciate you with your answers. That was quick, <laughs> just, just last month. So good job. What I, I do have a question about what is the cost difference between the gas and electric? Do you have that figure I, anywhere? I'm sorry, I don't. Okay. I, could, I mean, certainly, certainly we can provide more information on this topic because I think it is relevant. The 5310 program is a federal program, mm -hmm. uh, but the arms of the state, as, um, as Commissioner Leopold pointed out, uh, Caltrans works with DGS on the equipment types. Yeah. And, uh, and so I don't have the per, um, the per unit cost difference. Okay, no, no issue. I'm sure we can find that. But basically, has it been? Uh, is this uh, something that you could do and find funding to make up that difference and join that grant program through some other sources? And I, I, know I agree with Mr. Yeah, Leopold. Yes, um, yes. Through the chair, the, um, they're working uh, um, on an EV purchase, uh, you know, program for 5310 for future cycles. So I know they're it's it, they're actively working on it, but they didn't want to delay uh, this programming cycle until that was resolved because I think there was a, a commitment to serving the needs of the people. Yeah, I, th I think that's an important commitment, but it's also those vehicles last a long time in the environment. And I understand these vans do about 1,600 miles a month. So six vans, that's a lot of greenhouse gas emissions for six vehicles. Maybe, I, I agree with John, maybe there's something that we can do to get these cars to be electric before we put them on the road. Yeah, Thank I'm you. I'm happy to follow up some more on that. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the public who would like to address us on the uh, state report? Okay, we'll move to item number 31, a request to begin environmental phase of the Highway 1 auxiliary lanes between State Park Drive and Freedom Boulevard. Sarah Christensen. Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> I'm Sarah Christensen of your staff, uh, project manager for all of the Highway 1 auxiliary lanes and bus on shoulder projects. And I'm here to talk about getting another project started on our corridor. I just want to put uh, things in perspective. Um, the Highway 1 projects, we do traffic studies, and our traffic studies look at a six hour peak period. That's extreme. Projects I've worked on in the past over the hill on corridors like Highway 101 or 85, 280. Um, the peak period is only three hours, maybe four hours if it's really extreme. So keeping that in mind, this is one of the worst commutes in the state. And we have an opportunity to relieve congestion. Um, consider the statewide funding opportunities available for transfer, sorry transportation investments today. We can improve our competitive edge for these statewide funds by getting this project started soon. Funding for transportation has become available as of late with the passing of Senate Bill 1 in 2017, which makes $700 million available every two years statewide for projects like ours. They're available on a competitive basis with project readiness being one of the main factors and we're fortunate to have local funds available to advance our priority projects and compete for these funds the staff recommends starting the environmental phase of this project between state park drive and freedom boulevard now to be ready for cycle three of these programs we are targeting the Solutions for Congested Corridors program and the Local Partnership Competitive Program with a combined amount of $700 million every two years. We have a unique transformational project on our Highway 1 corridor that gives us a competitive edge over the other regions in the state. Monterey and Santa Cruz County have legislation in place that allows us to operate buses on the shoulders of state highways. Monterey has chosen not to move forward with their projects because they don't have a program of projects like we do on their highway. That makes our bus on shoulder project the first and only bus on shoulder facility in the state. <coughs> Additionally, this specific project includes replacement of two railroad bridges with multimodal bridges that can accommodate both 
high capacity public transit and a trail. That's gonna improve our multimodal travel through the county. In my written staff report, I did not include a cost estimate for the environmental phase because we wanna see what the proposals come in at. I've done an independent cost estimate and I anticipate the cost of the environmental phase to be between $2 million and $5 million, which is quite a range. This project is consistent with the preferred scenario of the Unified Corridor Study, which this commission um, unanimously approved earlier this year. This project is included in the Measure D Expenditure Plan Highway Corridors category under the Highway Safety and Congestion Reduction Program. The Budget Administration and Personnel Committee earlier, uh, I'd say last month, recommended that staff move forward with this project. We have an opportunity to relieve congestion if we invest our local funds now. We could get the environmental phase underway early next year and have environmental clearance in time for cycle three of the SB1 programs. We can leverage our local funds to construct these projects and start experiencing congestion relief. This project specifically includes a constrained choke point of the two railroad bridges. It's been called the Aptos Strangler, if you remember the speaker series last year. That makes this project that much more important because it's a life and safety issue. If we were asked to evacuate in case of a natural disaster, we would be constrained at that point. Highway 1 truly is the lifeline of this county. So considering that, staff requests your uh, approval to release an RFP to hire a consultant to get this project going and negotiate a cooperative agreement with Caltrans. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, uh, Mr. Johnson? So uh, give, us a, give us a timeline in terms of uh, start date and completion date, just in broad terms. So, because it's one of the questions that I'm sure a lot of commissioners, and including me, who get asked that question, you know, when, when is this gonna start and when is, when is it gonna be done? Because, um, and I mention it again, because, you know, part of the campaign literature, uh, the, the byline was get Santa Cruz County moving again. And a big part of that perception was doing what you're doing right now. And I wanna thank you for your exemplary work. You've done a lot of good work on this, uh, fighting to keep, make sure it, it, to the best of your ability to uh, keep it on track. So thank you. Thank you. So the environmental phase, if, if we get the green light, I can have the RFP out and we'll be back at the February commission meeting uh, with a negotiated contract. That's the schedule that I think we can, we can do for the environmental phase. And then we expect a two year environmental uh, clearance phase, which would line us up right before cycle three of the funding applications. So when you talk, you talked about the funding um, possibilities and this um, county or this uh, um, region being eligible for extraordinary funding from the state, help me understand what kind of funding, maybe numbers, and what the sources of those fundings might be. Sure. Uh, the two funding programs that we're targeting is uh, the Solutions for Congested Corridors program, which uh, is $250 million per year statewide. And the way that they uh, have these call for projects, they have them every two years. So that sets aside $500 million every two years for the Solutions to Congested Corridors program. And that program requires a uh, multimodal corridor plan for, um, for any project that uh, asks for uh, those funds. We have met that uh, need through the Unified Corridor Investment Study. We completed that and so we are eligible. We checked that box. The one thing we don't have for these projects, which is why we can't apply this cycle, is we don't have environmental clearance because we haven't, we haven't even started on this project. And so that's why 
you know, project readiness is really a, one of the main factors. Um, the other program is a local partnership program that sets aside $100 million annually statewide. So again, every two years, so that sets aside $200 million every two years. So that's how you get the $700 million. That program requires a 50% match of local funds, and it's really, um, the local partnership program is really uh, put in place to um, reward self-help counties like us who have taken the initiative to pass a sales tax measure. Uh, and that's why we get a, f a formula share and we get a competitive pot that we can also compete for. Does that match um, uh, necessitate the need for bonding and have actually having cash uh, equivalents? Or can you just say, well, we're going, we have a stream of income that we're going to be able to apply to this? I'm, I'm not quite sure. Maybe the executive director knows that. So when we uh, complete the environmental phase and we start to put together our application, we'll have to come up with a funding plan. Um, as part of that funding plan, we will have to show how much local money we're putting towards the job um, and how much um, state money we're requesting. Um, it doesn't require us to bond per se, but um, bonding might be a good strategy to consider because the more money that we show we're putting towards the project, the more attractive it would look um, when the CTC is analyzing our application and deciding whether to, to fund it or not. But that can be a discussion as we uh, complete environmental, how best to, to advance these projects and strategize to get them all completed. So, uh, Chair, just one last question. Sure. So um, this passed, you know, Measure D passed in 2016, and uh, I've received questions about the environmental part of this equation, Sarah. Uh, if somebody was to ask, why weren't we concurrently, while we were talking about rail lines and everything else, why weren't we con concurrently doing what we're doing now? In other words, two and a half years ago or something like that as far as the environmental studies. Right, why weren't we advancing projects to compete for this money? SB1 was passed in 2017, so that really, I get asked a lot why Highway 1 hasn't been improved yet. And prior to having Measure D and prior to SB1, there was not a lot of transportation funding out there, and that has always held this county back. And now it's a completely different climate. We have our own sales tax measure, and there's big money at the state level for us to compete for. Thank you. And if I can add on one, one point, too, is we have started environmental on three other sets of auxiliary lanes. This is, um, we're just doing it kind of sequentially down the line. So we are, we had already started the strategy. This is just extending it to all the way up to freedom. Thank you. I, I would also re remind the commission uh, before uh, Mr. Preston or Ms. Christman uh, joined uh, uh, the RTC, our commission um, made a decision after 12 or 13 years of putting together the EIR that we were going to have the tier one and tier two work where we were going to do a, see if I get the names right, the program level document for the six miles and the project level document for just the next segment in order to, to actually get it across the finish line. Uh, and that was a decision that was made by the commission. Um, and it meant that there still needed to be new, needed to do project level work. Um, and since the, these two have joined our staff, that's what they're starting to work on. Thank you. Just one quick, um, for on SB1 for self-help counties, is there a, a pocket of money is it the total about 200 million statewide is that right is it about to be divided between those self-help counties in the it's, state it's a hundred million a year Are, in in the competitive pot Th there's been some legislation right now about how to split it up whether to do it all by formula or make a, a, a portion of it competitive um, the bill that was put forward was actually not signed by the governor so now it's up to the CTC's discretion in the past, it was 50% competitive, 50% um, uh, formula. So uh, we were getting about um, $300,000 a year in formula funds, and we were able to compete for about $100 million, uh, 
about 200 million every two years. And it, we think the CTC is going to continue with that, but it's hard to say exactly what direction that they're going to go. If they can make the entire pot competitive, they could um, make the entire pot formula, but it seems like they would at least make 50% of it competitive, which is what they were doing before the governor vetoed the bill. Okay. Mr. Caput, did you, oh, did you have a question? Mr. Mulhern, go ahead. Just very quickly, I just want to thank staff very much for this project. Um, when we first came into office, uh, RTC was clear that, that this was just too much of a lift, and that's why the UCS ends where it ends and doesn't encompass the, this particular part of the, uh, the transportation infrastructure. But I don't know if people notice driving in from the north today, you can see that the Aptos Strangler is the genesis of congestion during our morning commute. Um, that congestion then filters out throughout the second supervisorial district and directly affects all of our constituents. And so I'm, I'm really happy to tell people about this project now. And we've been getting a lot of very positive comments when we bring it up in our community meetings. So thank you very much for your work, and I'm looking forward to this moving. Mr. Kaplan. Yeah, um, are metering lights uh, a part of this also? Uh, uh, they they seem to work. I don't know. Most people tell me that they do work, and I and I believe them. Right. So the Highway One corridor investment program includes uh, auxiliary lane projects. It also includes um, on the longer term solution uh, a vision for building HOV lanes, which will require replacement of almost every bridge uh, <coughs> overcrossing at the interchanges. Um, and at the same time, those interchanges may be reworked, rearranged um, to operate better. And we envision that the ramp metering improvements be uh, a part of those uh, interchange reconfigurations. And the ramp metering, uh, and the reason being that, um, first off, you know, the, if the main line isn't operating, what's the use of even having ramp metering? if you're metering into a congested <coughs> freeway. Uh, so that's why we're prioritizing the auxiliary lanes first. And then secondly, our ramps cannot um, accommodate the storage and capacity needed to have uh, queuing vehicles for ramp metering. So we envision that those improvements will come, uh, but not as part of these auxiliary lanes projects. Okay, and then one last thing. Uh Actually, uh, when Mr. Peoples was talking, I'm not an engineer, but you know, you are, uh, he is. And uh, I, I'm thinking of um, the, you know, the capacity of the, uh, of the freeway that we're working with. And then when I'm driving it, <coughs> there's that accordion effect where it stops, then you go a little bit, and then it stops again. Uh, people think <clears throat> that on a freeway we should be going 55 miles an hour, 65 miles an hour, and, uh, and flow right through. But if, we, if we're able to, what's making me believe this might work, in, the, in that bad area, if we could ca get cars just to move at 30 miles an hour, that would cut the commute time in half. And uh, is, am I correct in that? If we could just keep it moving rather than stop, go, stop, go, uh, right. we're gonna be able to do quite a bit. Yeah, and that's what the auxiliary lanes projects uh, do. They improve the operations for weaving um, and safety. And so it does, it does improve the operations in the flow. Okay, thank, thank you. Mr. Schifrin? Yes, um, as commissioners will remember there that these projects are not without controversy. So as I understand it, there is a lawsuit challenging the EIR for the progr program EIR for the HOV project and tier the tier one projects or tier two project. What's the status of that um, lawsuit? Has there been any decision? Is what's a timeline on it? Uh, because while we're talking about a later auxiliary lane project, the first 
priority for the commission is to move forward with the prior, with the auxiliary lane project between Soquel and 41st, and that depends on that lawsuit or the, the legality of that EIR. And if that is overturned, then that segment, which would be the first segment that would be constructed, uh, it will be delayed. So I'm just wondering what, what's going on with that lawsuit. Um, we met with Caltrans, I believe it was yesterday, and they're s almost done with the administrative record, and, and then they'll, they'll be moving forward from there. But we don't expect to receive any sort of injunction to stop work on that project, so we are continuing with the design, and we'll be moving forward with, with that project. And for um, the subsequent um, auxiliary lane projects on Highway 1, we are um, um, preparing um, independent EIRs that do not rely on the programmatic, um, they, we're not tearing off the programmatic document, so they should have no effect on on our future environmental clearances on the corridor. Will the lawsuit be uh, heard in Santa Cruz County or somewhere else? Do we I know don't know the answer to that, but I, I, will, I will investigate and report back. Given the importance that the commission has placed on uh, uh, SoCal to 41st project, I think it would be useful to get regular reports on how that's going because as we move forward with uh, design uh, which uh, and move towards going out to bid, it would be important to know whether, um, you know, whether the court has decided that, yes, it's acceptable, you know, the, the EIR is accept acceptable. Understood, and will do. Ms. Brown? Thank you for your work on this and, and all of our programmatic and project work. Uh, I have a question about the kind of overall, uh, I guess, uh, relationship between the ox lanes and bus on shoulder. I know we've gone, this has come up and we've talked about it, but I just want to try to get clear. Um, I mean, it's, so what we're really talking about is bus on ox lane is the plan, right? Um, from what I can tell. And I know that the Metro feasibility study did suggest that bus on shoulder could work, that it could be realized much more quickly. Um, and I'm just wondering if this is indeed, um, and it's good to hear that it may not be as held up as it could possibly be with the lawsuit, but is there any possibility for bus on shoulder to happen um, in the meantime and or kind of in conjunction with the rest of this project, given that we're, um, it's something that seems to be like, it, you know, could possibly work. Right. Um, and so or is it going to be, it doesn't seem clear to me that it would be uh, really studied further in this process, bus on shoulder only. So since the feasibility study, we have advanced the engineering uh, for the bus on shoulder. We've had many conversations with Caltrans. It is their facility. They own and operate Highway 1. And so we really have to meet their requirements and their needs. Another major stakeholder in the bus on shoulder is the CHP. They're extremely influential on what the facility looks like because this is a facility that they're going to be the boots on the ground out there enforcing. Um, and so we're really restricted to what those two stakeholders are requiring of, of the project. For example, um, there was, you know, operationally, an inside bus on shoulder would be preferred because you skip all of those ramp movements and the bus doesn't have to merge at all. It just fast track down the highway. However, that is infeasible um, according to CHP. That is something that they will not allow to happen. And so the legislation that I mentioned earlier requires Caltrans and CHP to approve the facility. And so we're really constrained on that. Um, as the engineering has progressed, we've gone through um, more of a detailed analysis of what can and cannot be done. And for example, if we have an existing shoulder that's 10 feet wide, we're okay with not replacing that shoulder. But if that shoulder is nine feet wide, we have to replace it with not a 10 foot shoulder, but we might as well do a 12 foot shoulder, right? And so the feasibility study looked at it at a snapshot kind of 10,000 foot view. 
we're getting into the nitty gritty details and we're getting more detailed and the feasibility um, given the constraints of the bridges on along Highway 1, um, in terms of return on investment, it really um, is the best bang for our county's buck to include these projects together. Um, and the other reason is, um, you know, the community would not like it if we went out to construction one year and then one year later we go to construction, you know, if we advance bus on shoulder and we get maybe six months out of the year and then we have to take it out and as part of the auxiliary lanes construction later, I don't think the community would, would dig that. <laughs> so we're keeping a lot of things in mind when we're moving forward and um, if there is a low hanging fruit option, we're definitely narrowing in on those. But unfortunately, this is the best path forward for this project. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir, Mr. Gonzalez. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to thank you, staff, for all your hard work. Uh, and I know the residents of Wattsville are going to greatly appreciate it once we get this bus on shoulder and auxiliary lanes open and traffic moving because uh, they, they are kind of tired of sitting in an hour and a half traffic and waiting to get to work. Um, but w one quick question, though, uh, and I know we're going to have to replace the rail uh, bridges, and, and I'm hoping that it, it is going to be designed so, because you had mentioned HOV possible lanes in the future, that the, these bridges are going to be built to accommodate that expansion. Absolutely. Any uh, bridge that we replace over Highway 1 will accommodate future uh, HOV lanes. Any other questions? Uh, any questions from the public? Uh, Michael Sain again, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Uh, <clears throat> I live at the Aptos Strangler. And I am very glad we have something in common that we want to get this issue done with. I think our primary difference is we just want to do it with a different method. Um, basically, if you refer to November 4th, 2019 um, letter from Mr. Rick Longinotti uh, con concerning the um, Measure D revisions expenditure plan, revisions to that plan. Measure D requires that revisions to the expenditure plan follow a certain process, which is section 25B, also section 180207 of the Public Utilities Code. We don't see any money set aside for going this far in the Oxlane project. If you look at it, it's not included in the uh, Measure D little pie situation. So once you go through the Measure D, Section 25B, what came Campaign for Sustainable Transportation requests is that the com Commission not issue a request for proposals with intent to hire engineering and environmental constraints before undertaking the process outlined in this section of Measure D. Also, we would further request that you direct staff to undertake an examination of bus on shoulder options that do not require the construction of auxiliary lanes. The bus shoulder on shoulder feasibility study, which uh, Commissioner Brown referred to, examines such options and indicates that they would be substantially less expensive than building auxiliary lanes. Just in general, commissioners, what we're asking is that you depart from the Measure D mandate and that a fair decision on a bus on shoulder is only valuable if you do a comparison of options without aux lanes. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, I'm David Van Brink, 30 year resident of Santa Cruz City and Count County. Uh, so it sounds like you're uh, considering some rearranging and reprioritization of uh, the various projects and Measure D items. The piece that jumps out at me, of course, is new bridges uh, uh, to Aptos Village and back. And I think that uh, this will appeal to trail enthusiasts in general. That's the piece of the project that jumps out at me. Thank you. Hi, Brian Peoples, uh, Trail Now Executive Director. We absolutely support moving forward with this um, RFP going out for design. Um, we'll add to that, though, is, um, you know, 
there's an opportunity possibly, and I'm not an expert on it, but I believe staff has experts on this, that if we look at toll roads as well as part of the equation for Highway 1, um, that may add some additional opportunities for our, com our community to find funding. So I'd, we'd ask that you include in your, um, ask staff to go and see how would toll roads as part of the equation which, of course, would be a toll in HOV lane. Now, one of the things we want to do is backtrack and say, hey, toll roads aren't the luxury uh, Lexus lanes. Really, they're about opening up the corridor, right? Watsonville is suffering. Aptos is suffering. The years and years we wait for not opening up the highway corridor so we can have heavy traffic flow through that to reduce the congestion on our surface streets, to make them safer. We need to do that. So anything we can do to incentivize the state and the feds to give us more money quicker is going to benefit us. Now, secondly, I want to talk about a specific detail. Um, Kim Schultz, who was the engineer prior to Sarah, I, I talked to him about Tier 1. And um, in Aptos, those rail, two rail bridges, um, the actually to, the co the, to do the widening, you actually have to lower the highway because the rail corridor has to stay flat, right? So it actually adds like $40 million to your project. So what we're advocating for is look at keeping the rail corridor on the ocean side. Only have one pedestrian trestle come over, and it's a pedestrian trestle, so it doesn't have to lower the highway have it on the northern one, and on the southern trestle, where it goes towards Rio Del Mar Tennis Club, is actually, now we're not going over the highway, actually divert it and have it go in between Soquel Drive and the highway as a dedicated bike lane that goes all the way to Aptos Junior High and Aptos High School. And that would be a protected lane. It's a game changer for, this, for that community. And you're addressing the Aptos Strangler because you're immediately pulling off the rail line not going through the village. And that curve, you're making it more straight. So I encourage you to look at that engineering design, which we did talk to prior staff about. So again, we do support moving forward with this. Uh, we believe that it's the right move. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Schifrin. One of the speakers indicated that the commission would be violating a section of Measure D by moving forward with this project uh, at this time. Would you respond to that, please? We've looked closely at the sales tax measure, and we believe that the highway corridor, which is 25 percent of the overall sales tax measure, includes um, um, a category for highway safety and congestion reduction programs. Um, that would allow um, additional auxiliary lanes to be built. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. <clears throat> yeah, also with respect to what certain uh, speakers say, um, when I hear words or phrases like depart from Measure D mandate, um, that's worrisome. There is a compact or, or there was a compact or a covenant between this body and the voters when they approve Measure D. And, uh, and the, you know, it's absolutely clear that, uh, you know, a full 25 or I forget 30 percent is for the highway, for that um, thoroughfare to, to be widened to meet the congestion needs of our community. Now, you know, at some point there are going to, it was also alluded to the fact that at some point there are going to be electric cars driving uh, uh, on this road. It might be 10 years, it might be 20 years, it might be 30 years. But there, it's so patently obvious to so many people, especially those that sit in that traffic, that there's a need for this. And so to kind of uh, blatantly uh, defy the, the, I think, the will of the voters when they voted for this particular project at two-thirds, and by the way, Mr. Longinati, I think his name was, 
predicted in Santa Cruz City chambers uh, that when the polling came back at 67 percent, or 66 percent, there was absolutely no chance that this would pass. Well, it did pass. So, and a big part of that was the people who looked to get Santa Cruz County moving again. And this is a big element, or a big part of that uh, has to be what we're discussing right now. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from commissioners? Um, entertaining a motion to accept um, the recommended action to begin an environmental phase of Highway 1 auxiliary lanes and bus on shoulder project between State Park Drive and Freedom Boulevard. I'll make a motion. All right, I'm not sure who did that, but- uh, well, I'll second it, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll have, we'll have somebody from, uh, Mr. Cap, Johnson makes motion, Cap it second. There we go. It's actually me, but that's okay. Okay. <laughs> Bertrand make the motion, Cap it second. All those I clarify, um, since the motion was made very um, quickly, that the motion is to approve the staff recommendation on uh, page 31-1, which in has two components to it. Fine. Is that what the maker and the second had in mind? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Excuse, sorry, okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Okay, we'll go to uh, item number 32, the Devon Davenport Crossing Project. Grace Blake Blakesley. And good morning, Commissioners. Grace Blakesley of your staff. Um, staff was requested to bring some information back to the Commission about the Davenport Crossing Project, and so we're at our September meeting, and here we are today. Um, Many of you know about the North Coast Rail Trail project. It's the 7.5 miles of the Monterey Bay Scenic Sanctuary Trail um, between Wilder Ranch and Davenport. Um, the project has been divided into two phases. The first phase spans 5.4 miles from Wilder Ranch to Panther Yellow Bank Beach. Um, phase two sp spans two miles from Panther Yellow Bank Beach to uh, Davenport. The project also includes improvements to three parking lots, the Davenport parking lot, Panther Yellow Bank Beach parking lot, as well as Bonnie Dune. It also includes access from the Davenport parking lot, a pedestrian crossing to um, the community of Davenport on the inland side of um, Highway 1. I wanted to note a correction in the staff report um, that I described the um, crossing. Um, the crossing would uh, connect from the Davenport parking lot to the north side of Ocean Street. Right now, the Dav at Davenport, there is an overhead arm containing flashing beacons and ped pedestrian advanced warning signs and speed back, uh, feedback signs as you enter the town of Davenport from both the north and south. Pedestrians frequently cross between the unpaved parking area on the coastal side of Highway 1 to the town of Davenport on the inland side of Highway 1, and community members have expressed concerns about these pedestrian crossings. Um, recently, Caltrans did reduce the speed limit on Highway 1 in Davenport from 45 miles per hour to 40 miles per hour and installed additional high visibility pedestrian signs in the area. The environmental impact report for the RTC's um, Segment 5 North Coast Rail Trail project did evaluate um, the Davenport parking lot as well as the pedestrian crossing that we are discussing today. And the EIR for the project was approved by the Commission in March um, of 2019. A preliminary design for the parking lot and the pedestrian crosswalk um, has been completed. Um, the Central Federal Lands um, Design Team did come to Santa Cruz in September to review the entire project, including the pedestrian crossing. Final design for the project, again, including the pedestrian, uh, pedestrian crossing, which referred to often as a Davenport crossing, is scheduled to be complete in August 2020. Um, and phase one of the North Coast Rail Trail project is scheduled to go to construction in August 2020, 2021 and is funded. Phase two, which is the part that um, extends from Yellow Bank Panther Beach north to Davenport, as well as the three parking lot improvements and the pedestrian crossing, will be built at the same time if we can s secure funding for that portion of the project. Um, RTC is seeking opportunities uh, to construct phase one and recently submitted a grant for Prop 68 funding to the California Natural Resources Agency. The grant funding request was for $4 million, which was the maximum amount of funding allowed through this grant opportunity. 
the grant opportunity would allow us to construct um, the, the phase two components that I described, but did not include funding for the pedestrian crossing. Um, RTC is seeking opportunities to fund the pedestrian crossing in coordination with the County of Santa Cruz. Um, the County of Santa Cruz has indicated in a board action um, on Tuesday that they would commit um, 125,000 in regional surface transportation exchange project funds and 50,000 in developer fees for the Davenport crossing. RTC will consider programming um, some of RTC will consider programming some of the Measure D funding um, at its December 2019 meeting at staff's, at staff's recommendation. We provided a handout today um, of the Santa, County of Santa Cruz staff report to their board, um, you, so you should have received that this morning. RTC and Santa Cruz County Public Works staff have been talking with Caltrans and trying to find a way to advance this project at the request of the community. Um, we have determined that the best way to move forward with this project is to continue to include it in the North Coast Rail Trail project. One of the primary reasons for doing this is that the parking lot improvements on the coastal side of um, Highway 1 in Davenport will provide a pedestrian landing um, for the pedestrian crossing, which is something that Caltrans has expressed that it's very important for them to see that um, as part of the project. So we are working with the County of Santa Cruz and Caltrans to continue to move this project forward as part of the North Coast Rail Trail project. Um, and we will return to, to you to, um, in December to request Measure D funding um, be applied to this project. Did you say December 29th? I'm sorry, December 2019. 2019. Okay. I apologize yeah, if yeah. I said um, night then. I think the meeting's actually the 5th. Earlier it was mentioned it was the 4th, but I think it's December 5th, 2019. 5th, so let's yeah. get our date straight. Okay. Mr. Schiffer, I'm sure you have some comments. <laughs> I'll, keep, I'll keep them very brief. I want to thank staff for their work on this, as well as the County Public Works uh, Department. Um, the, this is a complex project, as I think the commission knows in terms of the North Coast Rail Trail. Um, I th Commissioner Coonerty has been convinced that the approach uh, proposed by staff is appears to be at this point the most feasible, and we appreciate the staff work on it. Um, we've Commissioner Coonerty has talked to Davenport residents who are very concerned that this project move forward um, based on the staff recommendation and to uh, reduce uh, traffic on Highway One. They didn't. I don't think they showed up today, um, but hopefully when this comes back in December, there will be representatives from the community uh, to support this recommendation. And one point to you know focus on, if the commission doesn't receive funding for phase two of the rail trail project, the intention and uh, one of the reasons also for having this set aside of county and commission funding for just the crossing is that that project can move forward independently uh, and not have to wait for God knows how many years till phase two can get funded. So again, thank, I want to thank the staff for their work on this. You, Mr. Bertrand? Yeah, I want to echo um, Schifrin's comments on combining so that you can move forward. I think that's great. And he alluded to the fact that Ryan's already talking to constituents in the Davenport area. But I don't see any mention here of an actual outreach, maybe a community meeting, just to have that kind of review. Mm -hmm. Is that being planned? Um, and we have talked about that internally. We've been floating the idea just recently with the county of having a public meeting in the springtime after the next set of design plans are complete. Um, we would be discussing that also with the Cal Central Federal Lands at our next meeting um, to talk about the opportunities for sharing additional information and getting additional input. Thank you. Any other comments from commissioners? Uh, any comments from the public? Okay, I move uh, the staff recommendation. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered. We will now go to item number 33, amendments to, uh, to fiscal year 1920, the budget and work program. My name is Tracy New. I'm from RTC staff, and I have before you the proposed uh, budget amendment. Speak up a little. Speak up. Speak up a little. Or if it's mic on. It's mic on. There you go. Tracy, okay, go ahead. Speak right into the mic, please. No. 
Just speak up, please. All right, I'll speak up. Um, <laughs> I have before you um, a proposed amended budget for fiscal year 1920. Um, this, these, this budget includes amendments to the previous budget adopted by the board. I mean, the commission, apologies. Um, the format is quite different than in the past, but uh, the information is similar. Uh, most notably, we have some carryover TDA revenue that we would like to disperse. Um, we're asking for additional amounts to um, fund the reserve to meet the 8% goal established by the RTC. Um, 55,000 of the TDA uh, carryover funds are reserve surplus um, for RTC's countywide bike signage project. 20,000 for um, improvements to the Santa Cruz County travel model and a portion the remainder of the TDA to Santa Cruz Metro Community Bridges, the Volunteer Center and the local jurisdictions in accordance with the formula established by the RTC. Those are the um, major requests in this proposed budget, but also wanted to point out a couple of um, changes to the format that um, may be different to what you are previously seeing, and that would be for the administration budget. Just wanted to make note that the administration budget um, is combining the Measure D admin budget and the RTC admin budget. Both budgets had previously been adopted and approved. They're just being um, combined and consolidated into one GL key. Uh, as you know, when we um, expend funds for any programs or projects for Measure D, Measure D reimburses RTC, and so you will see those in the revenue line, um, but the expenditures come out of RTC operating funds. Um, after TDA, uh, we have our RSTPX um, proposed budget that includes all of the projects that are expected to be completed. It also includes uh, programming funds that are, I'm sorry, funds that have not been programmed yet for <coughs> fiscal year 18, 19, and what we expect to receive in 1920. In September, um, the commission um, made their intention to dis uh, allocate the funds by formula, and uh, that will be determined later. So you'll see a $7 million or $7.4 million uh, funds not appropriated line um, that will be brought to the commission at a later date. After the RSTPX funds, there's the staffing budget. Staffing budget includes actual true costs of the staff and all of the employee benefits um, and insurances. Uh, we use this information for budgeting purposes to pay, uh, make payroll and pay CalPERS um, all of the employee insurances. But what we use this information for as well is there's a portion that is uh, directly allocated for programs and projects. And what staff does is they track their time for each program and project. And we um, apportion, or allocate that cost to the program and project as well as an allocated overhead expenditure. So you'll see throughout the budget, there's allocated um, labor and allocated overhead. Those are the amounts that we are expecting um, staff to uh, dedicate to those programs and projects, but the staffing budget is the true cost of staff. Okay. Questions? Ms. Kaufman Gomez? Yes, thank you. Um, I noticed here on item four, um, the, the metro, the bridges, the volunteer center, what does the volunteer center do or have to do with transportation or the purpose of giving them or uh, any of the, the funds left over? Yes, the uh, Transportation Commission provides funding to the Volunteer Center from the Transportation Development Act funds because they provide specialized transportation services. Um, part of it is, uh, well, the main thing that they do is they, they have volunteers that provide rides to um, uh, uh, folks that cannot get uh, rides to you know, various needs that, that okay. they have and, and some other means, whether it be through regular transit or through uh, 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 the services provided by the the, the uh, lift line. So lift line, paracruise, and the volunteer center. Um, so for example, Jacob's Heart, um, they also help with transportation for some of their patients to get up to Stanford. Would that be another entity since they would also be transporting that may be um, a service that wouldn't necessarily be available with a, the community bridges or the, the, the paracruise? Yes, uh, folks can ask the volunteer center, and and uh, with the volunteer center, however, it, it's it depends on the volunteers that they have available for for the rides that, pe that people request. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, you, I know they're they're always actually you know looking to have you know, sufficient volunteers for all for all the requests that they have. So then a lot of times they don't have sufficient volunteers. So. And then. I know that we see an allocation on these other items, so this is like whatever would be left over. How much do you think that would be in the bucket for on 
that part of the allocation? The numbers are on page 33-12. Okay, I see. I'm looking at it from one. Thank you. Um, one more note to our difference in the format is that the Measure D budget is shown separately from RTC's operating programs and projects. So Measure D has a separate fiduciary fund, and when money comes in, we allocate directly to the uh, direct recipients, and then the rest of the money is apportioned to the investment categories as outlined in the ordinance. When there are programs and projects that are um, funded by Measure D, the local jurisdiction or, RST, or RTC um, will request a reimbursement of those funds. And that's why sometimes it'll look like they're budgeted twice. It's because they are. And we um, present separate financial statements and they're audited separately. Um, this budget was presented to the uh, Budget Administration and Personnel Committee on October 10th. And um, I believe that we've incorporated all of their questions and comments into the staff report and the presentation. Hey, Mr. Leopold. Uh, I just want to uh, thank you and the staff. Uh, I think this new format is uh, very accessible. It's easy to it's easier to understand, and I think it'll help us uh, be able to track the money as as well as possible. So I just want to recognize you for that work. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So um, on um, staffing resources, uh, page five. It talks a little bit about adjustments through the timing of payments for CalPERS for the UAL. So when you talk about separate fiduciary funds though, and, and Measure D funds, do you divert Measure D funds for the purpose that I just described here? No. Is it, or is this all just uh, some of the STA and TDA and funds from that arena? It's from all the different funding sources. With Measure D, the only way we would uh, capture any of those types are through our indirect cost allocation plan. So if we have, uh, let's say, MBSST and we have staff costs associated, there are direct labor and then um, allocated overhead. And in that allocated overhead are all the um, agency-wide costs that we can include in our indirect cost allocation plan rate. And that ICAP program is run through CalPERS. They audit it. They approve it. And that's what we're allowed to recoup in the costs. So Measure D is not diverted for anything other than programs and projects to um, administer the ordinance. All right. Thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? Uh, any questions from the public? Okay. We have a staff recommendation to move. Pardon me? Also move. So move. Uh, second. Moved and seconded to approve to approve the um, amended fiscal year 19 or 2019-20 budget and work program. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered. We will go to item number 34, the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Corridor Environmental per Permitting Contract Award. <coughs> Ms. Grace Lakesley. Good morning, commissioners. Through preservation efforts that have been underway on the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line, staff identified the need to procure an environmental services consultant. We have I, we the need identified um, the need identified services for to prepare technical studies, to perform field surveys, to prepare and submit permit applications to resource agencies, and to perform associated monitoring work um, with environmental regulations and requirements for planned repairs and some preventative maintenance activities. Um, the short term needs included project-specific environmental permits for two remaining storm damage sites located north of Santa Cruz, sites five and six, and high-priority bridge repairs. The longer-term needs include a programmatic pit permit to allow for some ongoing maintenance and repair activities as part as RTC's preventative maintenance program, bridge management program, and other future repairs as needed to preserve the rail corridor. Four proposals were received in response to a request for proposal for these environmental services. Based on the interview and evaluation criteria, Harris and Associates, Harris and Associates was identified to have the highest ranked proposal. Harris and Associates has experienced permitting transportation projects, preparing programmatic permits, and conducting environmental analysis and monitoring. 
The scope of work for the proposed contract with Harris and Associates includes projects of specific environmental permitting for storm damage sites five and six, high priority bridge repairs, and a programmatic permit for maintenance activities. For example, maintenance activities could include but wouldn't be limited to culvert and ditch maintenance, at grade roadway crossing maintenance, vegetation, and control. The complete scope of work is included as Exhibit B of Attachment 1. To accomplish the work, the scope to accomplish the work required to obtain the resource agency permits, um, the task would involve review of existing information and surveys to fill data gaps, detailed project descriptions for inclusion in the permit applications, an analysis of how to identify um, permitting permits for all projects for when in cases where they can be grouped and can be moved forward most efficiently based on the tasks involved in that particular project, the presence of sensitive resources near to that project, and the timing for project delivery. Um, technical studies will also need to be completed for the permit applications. These would include wetland delineations, biological assessment reports, cultural and historic resources reports. Um, the agency coordination is a key component of this work, and it involves um, coordination with U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, Regional Water Control Board, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Coastal Commission. Um, the scope of work also includes monitoring for pre- and post-construction activities for the project-specific permits. The environmental resource permit applications for the storm damage sites five and six and the bridge repairs are planned to be submitted as those project specific permit applications in order to complete these repairs sooner. Work to repair the applications for these projects um, will are expected to submit the applications to the resource agencies in May 2020 and be approved in March 2021 with construction allowing um, and allowing for construction in summer or fall 2021 of those projects. The application for the programmatic permit will cover future routine repairs to bridges that are not included in the high priority bridge repairs since many of the 29 bridges on the rail corridor are timber bridges require up repairs every two to five years. Once obtained, the program permit will allow the RTC to make future repairs, as I mentioned before, over a period of five years. Um, I, items that will be included in that programmatic pit again, permit again will be the vegetation control, culvert clear and repair, and bridge repair. Every year under that programmatic permit, RTC would be required to su submit these projects that were to be undertaken specifically for that one year period, um, but that is a much shorter review time um, through the resource agencies, and that's why there's the benefit of getting the programmatic permit for the complete five years instead of submitting a project specific permit for each maintenance activity. Harrison, Asso excuse me, Harrison Associates will We'll work with RTC to streamline the permit process, again, by combining projects or moving them forward concurrently as um, project schedules may change or um, input from resource agencies indicates that they would be more likely to approve a permit if projects were consolidated. RTC staff has um, negotiated costs with Harrison Associates to complete the work required in the amount of $606,198. Um, the portion of the contract work required to complete the storm environmental permitting for the storm damage repair and the bridge repairs are funded through the Measure D rail corridor funds from the 2017 storm damage repair and cleanup line and the railroad rehab line. Environmental permitting for the maintenance activities under the programmatic permit are recommended to be funded through the Measure D active transportation funds line for corridor encroachment and maintenance. Staff will seek reimbursement from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and the California Offices of Emergency Services for costs associated with the 2017 storm damage repair sites, including costs for environmental permitting services. Staff recommends that the RTC approve the attached resolution, attachment one, authorizing the executive director to execute a contract with Harrison Associates in an amount not to exceed $606,198 for environmental permitting analysis to secure the permits for the storm damage sites, the high priority bridge repairs, and the maintenance activities. Also, Wendy Young and Sh Shannon Bain from Harrison Associates are here today if you have questions for them. That concludes my report. <coughs> Six agencies have needed oversight, so interesting. <laughs> but uh, Mr. Leopold. Well, uh, um, I appreciate this uh, uh, this report because I didn't glean it from the um, 
the uh, staff report, the written staff report, that this will actually help us for five years to do not only the, the, the storm damage sites, but other sites along uh, the corridor uh, that will save us from having to go through all six agencies every time on every repair. I think that's, you know, it's, it's frustrating to see how long it takes to get through that permitting, and we know how long it takes uh, from some of our other storm damage work in the county. Uh, but being able to get this sort of larger uh, permission will really help us move things along after that. So I appreciate the work and look forward to getting this done as quickly as possible. And we think the storm damage sites repairs could, um, five and six, could fall into the programmatic permit. But because the timeline for the program permit is longer, we've pulled out those as project-specific permits. Um, the pr programmatic permit takes longer because there's additional negotiation required with the resource agencies on the project description. The concept of a project description might see simple to some of us, but it can be very detailed and it's very important that everyone agrees on all of the items that are included in that project description um, to make sure that they're covered um, for the construction. So in, in the future, we expect that similar types of storm damage repairs could be um, included it under our programmatic permit and frankly we hope to prevent some of those washouts by doing the required maintenance um, that we're talking about today. Mr. Bertrand. Yeah, um, you mentioned ongoing inspections dealing with um, other other uh, things including um, bridge repairs and Capitol has been waiting a long time for a report on the status of the trestle going across Soquel Creek and since um, we have a new director, it's mentioned that we're going to be putting an overall uh, report on that. Uh, when's that anticipated? We've um, decided that in terms of the Capitola Trestle, um, to really do an analysis as to what needs to be done with it, we need to consider what the use is going to be. So. Because we've just started the alternatives analysis for public transit on the rail line, it really doesn't make sense to try to analyze whether or not this bridge should be retrofit for um, its current use um, when we're considering a potential uh, different use. So we expect the alternatives analysis to be completed by January 2021. And then um, at that point, I think it would be appropriate to start looking at what, what the options are for the, the Capitola trestle. Thank you. I like that approach. Since we don't know what it's going to be used for, we decide firsthand. Totally agree with that. Um, in terms of the ongoing inspection of the rail line, trying to identify issues other than the ones we already know about that we're actually dealing with in this proposal, how are we actually carrying that out? Hi, Sarah Christensen again. Um, you're uh, describing our preventative maintenance program for the Santa right. Cruz branch rail uh, line. So in order for it to be preventative and not um, just a reactive maintenance program, staff uh, twice annually at a minimum inspects the entire line. Um, and that way we can pick up on things that could be problematic if we do not address them, um, such as a clogged culvert or a ditch that needs to be rerouted or regraded. Um, we try to catch those issues before we have a big storm, and then it becomes a bigger issue on our hands. And so um, that's our practice of the preventative maintenance program is to do regular inspections of the line. Oh, thank you very much. As a follow-up, if there's something that's major, it would be nice to know about that at a time because the cost would be rather high. Absolutely. Yes, we will be um, bringing any construction contracts to the commission uh, to request awarding construction contracts. So. Commissioner Schifrin, go ahead. One of the things that wasn't clear to me in the reading the staff report was when the line is going to be usable. Is it, is it going to be the fall of 2021? Is that the anticipation when the various storm damage re, um, uh, projects are completed? And I, I guess I'm thinking uh, in terms of the contract with Progressive Rail and the ex uh, excursion service that they're required to do, there's a time lag that uh, sort of holds that in abeyance uh, while the commission does the work on the line. So I, I just would like to see how or get a sense of what the timing of those, um, those issues are. So the, the storm damage job is five of the sites are located um, bet 
between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. And those five sites should be going out to construction uh, shortly. Two of those sites um, um, represent part of the Harkins Slough washout and um, will likely have an environmental restrictive window to the fall of 2020. So if we can get those uh, projects out to construction and get that section of the rail line completed by the end of 2020, 2021 would be um, when we would target um, um, also concurrently getting the tracks up to, um, to snuff and then that section of the line would be open. Um, as stated in, in by, by Grace regarding the other two sites, that's what we're, we're entering, uh, we're proposing to enter into a contract with today to get the environmental clearance for those sites. That will take a little bit longer and would probably be about another year off and then we don't know what, what windows would be associated with that, but that would allow additional excursion travel up to Davenport so um, you are correct in identifying um, that um, um, Progressive Rail does have a requirement to come back with us with their excursion plan by uh, March of 2020, and we won't have the line um, in condition that they could start that plan. So I have discussed that with Progressive Rail, and we're looking at um, options of um, when it would be a more appropriate time for them to come forward with that plan. So, you, but you're expecting that uh, the the line from Watsonville to Santa Cruz will be usable by the fall of 2020. Will will be in construction by the fall of 2020. Um, it should be operational as soon as that um, s that storm damage is complete, and then we will also have track upgrades and bridge repairs to complete. Some of those bridge repairs we can do now; they don't require permits; they're pretty minor. Um, some of the other track repairs, we'll have to see if uh, anything prevents us from moving forward with it. But we're hoping that by early 2021, we should be able to get the entire track between Watsonville and Santa Cruz operational. Hey, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Johnson? Well, you know, you, since you brought it up, uh, the, the whole progressive rail. So uh, I believe it was in this room where in uh, t July of 2018, we signed a contract with Progressive Rail. And so what I'm hearing is that three years later is when they're actually going to run that line. Is that a fair statement? Or 2021? I believe you guys entered into a contract with them. It was before my time in um, 2018. 20, 2018? The board action was in June 2018, and the contract was executed in July, yeah. as you said, Commissioner. But but yes, there there has been, um, but there were provisions in that contract that it would possibly take longer to get the storm damage jobs completed. Um, it's, as you can tell by the amount of work that went into this staff report and the negotiation con contracts and the number of agencies that we have to deal with, it's quite challenging trying to predict how long it's going to take to get various permits, but we're now, I think, um, if this action is approved, we'll be under contract um, to do all the work necessary to, to complete um, our obligations um, that are uh, required as part of the ACL. Since we're on the subject, what shared responsibilities does Progressive Rail have with the RTC in terms of what you just described, whether it's maintenance, whether whatever, or does that completely fall upon the RTC to have a, uh, a, 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 you know, a rail, a rail line uh, that can accept their uh, train, if you will. So we're required to get um, the track um, between um, milepost 7 um, to the end of the line at milepost 30 um, to class 1 standards, um, including doing the bridge repairs and doing the storm damage jobs. Once that is complete, then Progressive Rail would be responsible for the maintenance. But their responsibility for maintenance would be limited to their 20-foot easement. Because we own um, significantly more right-of-way than just 20 feet, there will be sections outside of their um, easement and their responsibility that RTC would continue to need to maintain. All right, thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? Any questions from the public? Move the staff recommendation. Second. Moved by Schifrin, seconded by Leopold. Staff recommendation. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
<laughs> Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Okay, now we will go um, to closed session. We have two items um, that are in closed session. One with uh, Save Our Big Trees versus Santa Cruz, City of Santa Cruz. Another one is the litigation case. Do we uh, anticipate any in reports after closed session? There, we do not anticipate any reportable action today. Excuse me? We do not anticipate any You do any not ant uh, anticipate any action. Okay, so um, we will go into closed session, and our next meeting um, will be December 5th at 9 a.m. at the County Board of Supervisors Chambers in Santa Cruz, 701 Church Street, okay. December 5th, 2019 at 8 or 9 a.m. Thank you. And <laughs>